Late. Yeah. Is this better? Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, just trying to get everybody back uh, and paying attention up here. And um, so one of the interesting things that I wanted to point out based on the last panel, and I, you know, I realized that, that there wasn't time for questions within that panel framework, but we needed to convey a lot of the information about what is happening with PACE nationally and in other states, because our experience here in New Jersey is that not many people are following this. And so, you know, the, the real successes that are happening around the country are not as well understood as they should be. Uh, but I did want to point out a couple of differences with the New Jersey uh, program, at least the current legislation and the legislation that's in the works, which is, first of all, we will be able to go up to 30 years as opposed to what you saw with 20 years. Uh, and secondly, the municipalities uh, take no responsibility for, um, you know, situations where uh, the homeowner default. So there's no guarantee involved. That does mean typically that our interest rates may be a point, uh, a point or half a point higher. Uh, but uh, the municipalities were very uh, committed that the municipalities have no liability, no risk, uh, and their credit is not encumbered, uh, and they don't have to have tax reserves uh, to deal with PACE programs. So having said that, I want to introduce briefly the panel members. And uh, this, the format of this panel is a little bit different. We're asking people to speak for maybe three minutes each and then open it up to the floor so that you get a chance to get all of your questions answered. And the uh, panelists uh, in this instance are uh, Ed Sayers, from Simon Property Group. You heard uh, in the previous panel how Simon has played a pioneering role in doing PACE projects around the country. And we're very appreciative for Ed flying in to help us with this. Uh, Kevin Moyer, who's from PACE Equity uh, and also chairperson of the Board of Northwest Ohio Advanced Energy uh, Corporation, Improvement Corporation. And uh, he can tell us a little bit about some of the more interesting and unusual ways in which PACE is being used in Ohio. Uh, Michael Licamelli is president of the MSL Group, and he's uh, one of our founding sponsors. In fact, our first founding sponsor, and so we're very grateful for that. Uh, and, but he also has an, some incredible stories to tell about uh, the PACE work that he's doing in other states. Uh, George Vallone is president of the New Jersey Builders Association, and he has been an incredible support uh, for us. Uh, he's also the president of Hoboken Ground Brownstone and doing some significant work in Jersey City uh, and certainly intends to use PACE as soon as it's available. Uh, and Marcos Vigil is deputy mayor of Jersey City for economic development, uh, and this is really the reason why we asked him to join this panel as opposed to one that involves municipal or state officials otherwise, because we think he can speak to the economic development uh, implications of PACE. So having said that, I'm gonna turn it over and ask Ed to uh, perhaps say a few words, and, uh, and then we'll move on quickly through the panel members and open it up for your questions. Thank you very much and good morning. So, um, I'm Ed Sayers with Simon Property Group. I'm the Vice President of Energy and Sustainability for the, for the company for basically the U.S. properties. Um, to start off a little bit, we started with PACE back in 09. One of our first projects was in uh, Sonoma County, um, Santa Rosa Mall that we have up there. We put a white roof on, which to this day has developed and uh, you know, we've had energy savings, you know, surpassing our own calculations. Since then, we have accelerated. Um, since then, we've uh, 
accelerated by programs. We're now in operating in four different states. Um, uh, California mainly, I know David Gableson made a uh, comment about the projects we have there. It is roughly about $5 million worth of projects that we just closed on with California First. Um, Texas, we're about to enter Texas now. Um, I have about $10 million worth of work down there that I'm getting ready to uh, start working with the PACE development as well. And I believe in Texas they call it the TPA, Texas um, PACE Authority or Agency. I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, but with that said, uh, we view the program as not only essential to our business needs because, to David's point, we're trying to lower our operating costs. Uh, we're trying to you know, em embellish the mall to become more appealing. And not only do we just look at energy saving in terms of electrical, we're looking at everything. And one thing in California especially, we embarked on a water conservation program since the state itself is in dire needs of, of water with the drought that they have. That is well accepted. I would urge every one of you that for saving a natural resource, that's exactly the kind of thing that PACE can help you know, municipalities and other folks do as well. Um, projects that we have going from range anywhere from lighting retrofits to complete retrofit or replacement of our central plant operations. Um, you mentioned HVAC, VAV. Um, Anything that turns, anything that rotates, anything that you have to turn a switch on to, I mean, that's essentially what we're after. Um, so I would say that the one other thing, as far as Simon is concerned, why it's so important for us, usually it would take us five to 10 years to spend capital to do any types of these energy projects. What PACE allows us to do is accelerate that curve to about a year or two years. So now I'm picking up all my energy savings in the front end, get my capital recovered um, at, at that same time. Yes, the, um, the SIR is always above one. One thing I will mention, the way we operate, um, we don't take it out over 20 or 30 years. We limit it to 10. That, that, that is a comfort zone for us as far as recoveries. Um, and it's, it's also challenging us uh, with capital. We're, we're going to work with the contractors. It is a local contractor community we reach out to. We bring in the subject matter experts, but for our purposes for in, in financing, we're trying to maintain and manage a balance between tax liability as far as what the tenant is paying us also for lease. So lease language does play a big role. Um, we do have limitations from time to time. They're not insurmountable, but as David mentioned before, some of our properties are more complex, especially if I have a joint venture partner on that, par on that particular property or um, if there's any indebtedness. Um, luckily for Simon, we do not have that many properties that we have indebtedness. We, we're 100% uh, wholly owned. So with that said, I will uh, turn it over to Mike. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Licamelli. I'm with MSL Group and we're in Connecticut. We, we currently do PACE projects in Connecticut and we're very much looking forward to uh, coming to New Jersey. I'd like to thank uh, Victoria and Jonathan for their efforts. They seem to be very energetic in helping get PACE across the finish line. So we, we very much look forward to being here shortly. Uh, just wanted to give you just a brief couple of examples of, of the types of projects we've been doing. Uh, and, the, and the first question, of course, is, you know, why do PACE? Why do PACE as opposed to, say, go to a bank or try to get and elsewhere? And uh, the, the answer is three short answers. The first thing is zero down. So for people who are trying to do projects themselves or they're trying to, you know, get clients to do projects, having the cash up front is, is you know, very, that's the most difficult issue, number one. Number two is immediate savings. So you're, every project is calibrated, so you're going to start saving money immediately. And part of the role of the Connecticut Green Bank, which I'm sure will be a role here in New Jersey, is that is that the projects are vetted. So for smaller property owners that maybe don't have the capacity to do their own analysis, they can turn around and, and, and know that the Green Banks or, or, or New Jersey Pace will be behind them to help know that they're going to actually get those savings. Uh, and, and the third thing is, uh, is that there's also, for the next year and a half, and then to a lesser extent going forward, a lot of these projects involve solar and solar power, and there's a very large tax credit uh, of 30% of your project cost over the, next, uh, over the next year and a half. So for example, we're doing a project in a 170,000 square foot uh, industrial building 
in Bridgeport, Connecticut. We're putting up 600 kilowatts of solar. The project's about $1.9 million, uh, including, it also includes a complete LED energy retrofit and several smaller measures. And the property owner is putting zero down to make the project happen. They're going to net about $70,000 per year in savings in year one, which grows as over time. And then lastly, they're gonna chop $480,000 off their tax bill this year. So those are pretty compelling numbers and those are pretty, pretty you know, good reasons that you know, don't kind of sell themselves. And so, so the second thing is just, okay, how do you get this done? And you know, there were some mentions uh, earlier about sometimes you know, PACE is a little complex. I, I, my just suggestion is, is you really <coughs> need to have you know, a team that leads the whole project through because there's a lot of advanced work you need to do to scope out the project and figure out exactly what you're gonna do first <coughs> and then, then go through the process figuring out who's gonna do it and what's the best options to choose. But once you go through that process and you scope out your project and you put it together, you can uh, go forward and uh, get the financing from PACE and uh, have those you know, you know, large, you know, good savings and take advantage of the tax benefits and whatever other credits available on a state-by-state -state basis. Thanks. Great, you just need to hold the mic really close. Yep. Swallow this thing, huh? All right. I'm Kevin Moyer. Uh, Pace Equity uh, is a project developer uh, and provides engineering and financing services to building owners. We're a relatively new company. Uh, we've got private capital um, backing us, and we really deploy our capital in three ways. Uh, we provide the upfront development funding uh, to identify the scope of the project, complete the engineering. Uh, and then we provide financing through construction and then financing through uh, the 20 year long term ownership under a, a PACE assessment agreement. I think uh, as you're thinking about getting this up and running in New Jersey, there's three things that you really have to be able to deliver uh, to the building owner um, and to the contractors and to the financiers to be able to make this thing work. And one is, you have to be able to talk in certain terms about what the pricing is on the deal. And that includes the cost of the project as well as the cost of the financing. You have to be able to talk in terms of certainty about the process. Uh, there can't be any ambiguity in, in the process. Everybody has to understand exactly what the process is and how it works. And thirdly, you have to be able to talk certainly about timing. Uh, these are big revenue impacting projects. These are revenue producing assets in many cases. These house productive workers and so the timing of these projects uh, is often uh, very critical. So what does that translate to for New Jersey? I think we're a believer in a low cost um, model for operating uh, PACE districts and I think many times those are not for profit led uh, but certainly that translates into low cost of operation, low fee structures. Um, we believe in um, an open market for developers and financiers to come in, work with municipalities, work with the building owners to quickly get um, businesses done, and again, clear um, and streamlined processes. Um, the worst thing that you can do is have too many hurdles and uh, benchmarks and information requirements for people to to comply with. If you have those things in place, uh, New Jersey will be off and running and you'll be um, completing projects all over the place. Why is PACE resonating um, with the marketplace? <coughs> and, um, David Gabriel touched on a lot of this, but I think PACE solves a lot of the fundamental environmental and social issues that we're facing. Uh, number one on that list, and I've, I've been on both the public side of this for the last five years, um, starting up PACE districts, running them. Um, it's, uh, it's all about economic development. When we go out and talk to a community about getting a PACE district up and running, it's really an economic development driver, it's an economic development tool, and it resonates. Uh, it helps, we're seeing buildings where we repurpose vacant buildings, we repurpose um, historic buildings, warehouse districts. Um, we have the ability to do new assets uh, for distributed generation, for new construction. Um, so it's a very powerful community sustainability and revitalization tool. Um, along with that, there's an extremely positive impact um, on the environment. 
if people are worried about whether you implement these measures and whether they work or not, I can tell you that if you take a building that hasn't had much done to it for the last 20 or 30 years, today's technology will drive 30 to 50 percent savings. No joke. And uh, we've been managing the energy, uh, um, the Port Authority in Toledo has done, done this with all of its buildings. And, um, you know, we're driving that level of savings and we've been able to measure that over the last six years. Um, by doing, by being able to do new construction in PACE districts, you can uh, take a 90.1 ASHRAE criteria, we can beat that by 20% um, and drive even lower cost of ownership, long-term cost of ownership um, in operation of that building uh, through PACE. And we can also drive um, new distribution, new alternative energy asset investment. Other examples are water, water impact and, and food chain impact. Um, we've got a couple projects in Missouri where one is putting energy systems into a fish farm, so sustainable food. Uh, we're powering greenhouses, we're powering uh, anaerobic digesters to take care of animal waste on uh, large commercial farms and generating pipeline grade natural gas to sell to Duke Energy. And then thirdly, it solves an aging infrastructure problem that we have in the U.S. That's water, that's buildings, and that's power. And then, like everybody's been talking, it's a capital formation tool. Uh, we firmly believe that PACE um, drives the cost of capital down overall for the building owner, and it replaces uh, the need for expensive equity into a project. Okay, thanks Jonathan. Hello everybody, glad you could all be here. This is an interesting subject. Uh, Victoria and Jonathan asked me to speak on the panel to talk about, sort of give a financial um, perspective on the program. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on that without getting crazy on numbers. I have to talk about a few numbers. Um, first of all, uh, I'm a multifam brownfield developer and right now the market is all about rentals. Capital is, is, is uh, rushing toward rental projects right now because they see that as lower risk and it's also a reflection of the credit crisis. Uh, I did condo development for 20 years, 25 years practically and then the recession hit, the credit crisis hit and everything <coughs> went rental. So um, I'm gonna talk from a perspective of rental because that's really the market that I'm in right now. And that's the vast majority of the multifam uh, market at this, at this point in time. So the way that a, um, a multifam building is valued is based on the net operating income. So the whole game is to increase net operating income. And once you have a net operating income, and the vast majority of builders, by the way, multifam builders, uh, I think, maybe not the vast majority, but I think the majority are merchant builders. And so their game is to uh, find land, build rental buildings, stabilize them, which means fill them up, complete them, fill them with tenants, and operate them for at least one year. Because after one year, you've got a pretty good idea of what your operating costs are going to be. So they refer to a rental building that's brand new and it's been operating as one year. They refer to the net operating income as a stabilized income. It's no longer a pro forma, a spreadsheet. When you're looking at a raw piece of dirt, uh, it's real. Once you have stabilized income, once you have a stabilized net operating income, then the, the buyers start to look at it. And what the buyers are willing to pay for it is expressed as a capitalization rate. Essentially, if you think about it, like if you wanted to buy a savings bond, if you had a choice of buying a savings bond and it was going to pay you 7% or 5%, you'd buy one at 7%. So in the, in the capitalization market, the lower the cap rate, the higher the value because you're dividing the net operating income by the cap rate. So if you have a, uh, a, a building that somebody's willing to pay you a four cap, they're gonna pay you more than if they wanna pay you a five cap. It's the value of the building, the value of the net operating income uh, is greater at the lower cap rate. So the value of the building, I'm sorry, the value of the building is greater the lower the cap rate. So the cheaper somebody's willing to accept on a return on that income stream, the more they'll pay for the building. And in a highly competitive market like where I am, 
and where Marcos is, Jersey City, particularly on the waterfront, cap rates are now hovering around 4%, which is amazing. So when you talk about energy efficiency and investing more money in a building, if you don't have a mechanism like PACE that's going to spread that out over 20 years, the extra net operating income that you're going to get is going to amortize the energy savings equipment, and that's going to lower your cash flow. So if your cash flow is lower, given the same cap rate, the value of the asset's lower. But what PACE allows you to do is spread it out. It's like you couldn't buy your, a house for $200,000. Who's got $200,000? But if you can borrow a mortgage and spread it out over 30 years, a lot of people can buy a house. It's the same exact thing. If you can spread the cost of the extra energy equipment and improvements out over a longer period of time so that the difference is positive, the difference being the savings on energy minus the cost of paying for the equipment that generates the savings on energy, then you're in the plus. The value goes up, the net operating income goes up, and the value of the asset goes up. So when you're, when you're first penciling out a building, when you're, when you're doing a pro forma, sometimes we call it a swag, a scientific wild ass guess. <laughs> You have to talk about what the three major components are. It's your land cost, your soft cost, your hard cost. So land cost, you know, you could get a good buy on land. That's one way to do it. You could get more density than you thought you were going to get. That's another way to reduce your land cost by getting more on it when you thought there was. You could get some type of a break in Jersey City. When you're near a train station, they give you a break on parking. You don't have to build one parking spot for every unit. So if you have a well-located property near a train stop, uh, you get a break because parking costs a lot of money in, in a high-rise building. Parking costs uh, $200 a square foot. Um, so uh, speed to market. Uh, Jersey City has a great planning department, has a great economic <coughs> development department. They work with you. If they like what you're doing and they think it's going to be a plus for the community, they'll rocket you through the planning board process. You'll get your, zone, you'll get your approval in one night. <coughs> Uh, if you don't do what they want, not so good. <laughs> so uh, there's different ways to uh, affect the cost of land. That's one piece of the deal. Soft costs. Soft costs, if you're a high volume builder, some of your soft costs you're going to realize economies of scale. You may do your architecture and engineering in-house. There's ways to, to get things done uh, with employees faster sometimes than independent contractors. And there's some economies of scale with soft costs. But the number one soft cost is financing costs. And that varies by the type of building, the type of builder you are. If you're a REIT, if you're a publicly traded REIT, you borrow your money on Wall Street, it's super cheap. Some companies self-finance. Uh, Toll Brothers, for example, who was my partner on the Maxwell House deal in, uh, in Hoboken, they self-finance. So uh, if you're a small builder, your cost, of <laughs> your cost of capital is very high. You have to bring in equity investors. You might use MES debt, which is expensive debt. You go to your banks, and they're going to try to make as much as they can, and it's expensive. Uh, if, so soft costs, they vary a little bit, but it's really the, the financing costs and the capability of the builder that brings that to the table. So hard costs, which is really what this whole conversation is about, is one of the ways you can affect NOI. And so the questions become, what quality level do I want to build to? Uh, is it better to put in the cheapest way to to HVAC in a high-rise building is heat pumps. You see them on a lot of buildings. It's like a little grill under the window, and you're burning electricity, and you're heating, and you're cooling, and it goes right on their meter, and the builder doesn't see it in his operating budget because uh, the tenants pay for the whole thing. So maybe you want to invest in what they refer to as a two-pipe system, where you're, where you're either, you, you've got a central plant, and you're sending hot water through in the winter, and people have their own little compressor, and they blow the air off the heat, in the winter, and in the summer, they throw cold air through the two-pipe system, which goes around and around and around. Or that's a little better, because now you've got the individual blower unit, condenser unit, burning a little bit of electricity, but you've got the economy of a big boiler or chiller. Or you could do a four-pipe. But the problem with the two-pipe system is everybody's heating or everybody's cooling. So if you've got one guy who likes it hot and one guy likes it cool, they've only got one choice. It's, it's based on the season, and you're going to be heating in the, in the heating season, you're going to be cooling in the cooling So you could spend a lot more money, you can do a four-pipe system. And that means people could, there's heat and cold circulating, and you can decide every unit can be warm or cool any time of the year. That costs the most amount of money. So 
you have these types of choices when you go to build a building, when you, when, when you go to design a building, and putting in higher efficiency uh, energy equipment without being able to amortize that long term is going to affect your NOI, and that's going to affect the value you can sell the building for. So that's the cost side. The, re the reason you have to focus on the cost side is because the <coughs> revenue is fairly fixed by the market. Where we are in Jersey City, it's highly competitive. So you've really got a certain quality level you've got to build to. You're going to get a certain amount of rents. I could tell you if you have a high-rise building on the river, uh, <coughs> you're going to be in the neighborhood of $45 a square foot rent. Everybody's there. You can't be much more. You, can't be, you don't want to be much less. So the revenue side is relatively stable, so you have to focus on the cost side. And, uh, and programs like PACE uh, allows you to invest the extra money without affecting the NOI, which, which then would, would affect the, the cap rate value of the building and the possible resale value of the building. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Jonathan and Victoria for inviting me uh, over to this panel. Uh, as a newcomer uh, to the full up administration, I'm always learning something new and always appreciative of uh, getting that learning curve uh, going. Um, I also want to thank my alma mater for hosting this. Uh, you know, I was uh, graduating from uh, this uh, institution when uh, this building came to force, so uh, I, uh, I am really grateful uh, to be invited uh, to be on this panel. Um, with respect to economic development from the perspective uh, of a municipality, uh, first, before I forget, as a recovering attorney, I always say this, uh, the views that I'm about to express are not necessarily those of the mayor or the administration that I do represent, but I will let you know if that's the case. Uh, I have to say, you know, one of the things that I find very attractive from the municipality perspective is the issue of no, li no liability for the municipality, uh, little to no risk. Uh, with respect to our finances, particularly coming from a municipality that uh, is, you know, an economic force right now, uh, driving uh, development for the state um, and uh, being that economic engine that, that we want it to be. From what we're doing and what more we could do uh, from the energy side, uh, over the past couple of years, uh, we have been working with developers uh, on getting projects that are LEED uh, registered. Um, and we have over 50 buildings already in Jersey City that are registered as such. Um, but we want to see more. Um, we know what our load capacity uh, is uh, in the state. Uh, I had a little bit of experience seeing that uh, on the New York side. Um, and uh, if we're going to continue to be at the density, if we're going to grow, uh, Jersey City in particular, if it's going to grow to be in 10 years the largest city in the state, uh, then we need to do more uh, with respect to energy efficiency um, within uh, the new construction that, that we're seeing. Um, another initiative uh, that may not necessarily play into this, uh, but it does affect residential is that we have started uh, a rain barrel initiative basically because we collect uh, the runoff from the rooftops um, and we've had a lot of uh, uh, building owners uh, registering and, and getting these rain barrels um, and that is very important for cities like Jersey City and uh, many other uh, of the cities that have a system like ours uh, which we're a combined sewer uh, overflow system uh, being an old city in the state so as a CSO, increasing technologies, increasing efficiencies within our water system, it's really, really important. George uh, can talk later a little bit about uh, some of the projects uh, that uh, we have been discussing lately. Um, but Superstorm Sandy obviously affected us all. Uh, being on the coast, uh, surrounded by two uh, important rivers, um, we actually saw the consequences of not doing sufficient investment in infrastructure uh, when times were good. So now that times are getting better, um, we are taking the opportunity to work with each one of the developers that are coming into Jersey City, looking at the infrastructure that is underneath them. Of course, uh, they all want some sort of density bonus uh, coming to us. <laughs> um, and uh, as George said, uh, we like to tell people what we want to see uh, in return for that density bonus. So 
um, locally, we have a really good uh, group of investors and developers coming into Jersey City that are seeing what the value is for them uh, with respect to the future uh, uh, properties and uh, their future, future sources of revenue. Uh, so doing a better investment in that infrastructure to improve that CSO system uh, is really important for us. Another thing which was mentioned in uh, the prior panel is affordable housing. Jersey City um, is basically under the leadership of the mayor um, is, is taking a strong stance uh, with respect to where we want to be in terms of affordable housing. Uh, we are very happy that the average median income from 2000 to currently has increased in Jersey City to about 15%. Um, but we're conscientious of the fact that the city is where it is based on the prior generations and the people that have lived there for a long time. And we really don't want to lose uh, that history. We really don't want to lose that character. So we're trying to find different ways, working with the tools that we have at our disposal to encourage further development in affordable housing. And the way that we can do it, and an additional tool in the arsenal, is basically decreasing those soft costs and the hard costs uh, for developers so that then we can start to see more affordable housing uh, coming in into Jersey City, particularly because our land value uh, is uh, so high right now uh, based on, uh, on all the different factors that have been discussed. And finally, uh, this is informed by, by prior experience in New York. When I was in New York as Deputy Secretary of State, I oversaw the Division of Consumer Protection. Within that division, there was a unit that is called the Utility Intervention Unit that represents rate payers before the Public Services Commission. And the basic mission of that office was to make sure that small businesses and those residents that are so highly dependent on fixed income didn't get uh, the low end of the stick uh, whenever utilities were coming in for rate hikes. And if we want to improve economic development in our state, one of the things that we have learned and that we know is basically we have to make sure that the overall consumer has more money in their pockets to be able to spend. And particularly for low income residents, it's very important to address the issues of <coughs> how much are they paying in energy, how much are they paying in utilities. So again, from the perspective of economic development, if we have sufficient tools to make sure that we're being much more efficient uh, with our systems, if we are finding better ways to use the resources that we have, eventually that comes to the benefit of the residents, that comes to the benefits of consumers, which will then in turn <coughs> use that additional money to spend it and make our economy grow. Great. Thank you all. And uh, I want to open it up for questions. <coughs> Uh, I got two questions. Um, they're sort of unrelated. Uh, what one is? What happens if the municipality goes bankrupt? So, like with you know Detroit, for instance, right? The city went bankrupt. Uh, I'm assuming they're going to have you know certain cities will have a lot of liabilities eventually as this grows. Uh, so I'm kind of curious to know what happens in that instance. And the other one is completely unrelated. Is um, we deregulated the power industry in the 90s, right? And that had a lot of impact, almost at the wrong time, right? Because that's when uh, solar was coming on board and wind and everything else. And now there's this weird competitive environment where you go out to a residential person, you're like, oh, buy your, comp you know, your power from someone who's not the power company. It doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense to anyone, right? So with all these initiatives, is there any pushback to re-regulate the power industry in any regard? So obviously two completely unrelated questions, but uh, curious about both. I'm 
I mean, the bankruptcy question, I, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, I think the bankruptcy question uh, for a municipality, you know, there's, there's a, it's basically the same. Bankruptcy is bankruptcy, okay? You have creditors, you have secured creditors, you have unsecured creditors. And so the secured creditors are going to have at the assets, and if the uh, assessments being paid as a result of PACE loans, uh, those are assets. Those incoming cash flows, just like the incoming taxes, are cash flows. So what will happen is there'll be, uh, this happened in Detroit, I believe it was, the, uh, the court appointed master says, okay, we have certain essential operating costs, police, fire, ambulance. And so the income extremes, which would be taxes, which would probably include the, the PACE uh, assessments if they were a PACE program going on, has to pay essential services. And then you start to look at whose secured creditors would be next and then unsecured creditors would be last. I think that's probably how it would work. Not a lawyer. And, uh, and these are the opinions of management. <laughs> Detroit, I think that's right. In Detroit, the general obligation bonds got in trouble. The water and sewer bonds are a separate revenue stream. And I think pay, if the PACE uh, revenues were supporting a bond issue, they're viewed as separate from the general fund of the city. So I think they would be protected. And that's I think that's why lenders are assigning such a high value to the PACE lien, because it is a separate um, obligation from the general obligation, and there's really no risk attached to uh, the municipality either. I mean, it's not like, um, let's say you had <laughs> all the building owners go bankrupt in a city, um, you know, th there's really no risk to the municipality, they're just the collector. So it, it kind of works both ways, and I think in most of our minds, it's a very high asset quality, investment quality. Um, on the other question, um, Google FERC.com. Yeah, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. <laughs> I don't know anybody's got an answer to that question on our uh, national energy policy and what direction it should go, but I'm in favor of open markets and competition in any regard. On the bankruptcy question, uh, I am a lawyer. Um, and I, I think the answer is, is actually fairly complicated, uh, and it depends on the municipality and how the taxes are collected. Um, it, in some cases, the taxes are kept entirely separate from any um, general obligation funds, and uh, in that case, uh, if the municipal municipality um, files for bankruptcy, the cash flow would not be uh, interrupted in any way. Um, in those states that are like that, the tax collector is independent of the municipality and its um, tax collector's duties are governed by the state constitution. In other states where the municipality collects the money um, and if that cash is actually put into a um, general fund, then there could be a delay in um, the distribution of cash uh, to the trustee or wherever that um, special assessment money is supposed to go. So in any of these transactions, if you have a financing system in place, uh, usually a securitization of some type, you do have to look at um, what in fact would happen in a bankruptcy situation, where the cash actually goes, and whether that flow of cash could be interrupted um, in a municipal bankruptcy. And again, that will vary from state to state. Hi. Um, if you could just talk a little bit more um, in a little more detail, and I think both of you sort of covered it slightly. Um, what is it that's going to make developers really care about energy efficiency and renewables and think this is something that I want to do, particularly in rental buildings where they're not going to receive that income? 
I know that George definitely is dying to take that question away from me, but uh, but basically it comes down to uh, you know the, the the bottom line, uh, and it is about decreasing the value of construction uh, when when they're coming in, uh, and uh, to the extent that it's a tool that can either affect the soft cost or the hard cost uh, of construction, um, it that's that's what they're looking for. Um, I, as I mentioned, from from a municipality perspective, uh, with the limited resources that we're going to continue to have um, in uh, in further years. Uh, it is important for us to find ways of working with the developers uh, and, and making sure that uh, the right tools are available to um, allow uh, construction to continue to, to grow, uh, particularly in, in Jersey City. Um, so I'm pretty sure, George, I mean, you covered this uh, a little bit uh, in, in detail already in your presentation, but you know, I think that that's pretty much uh, what, what it comes down to. Yeah, let me just two cents to that. That's definitely what it comes down to. It comes down to cash flow. Um, without a PACE type of program, you would have to make a bet that if you're building, let's say the average uh, utility bill for a renter in a high-rise building is uh, $300 a month, average year round, you would have to make a prediction, and essentially you'd have to convince your investors to make a bet that over a relatively short period of time, if your building was so energy efficient that your uh, utility cost was half, instead of $300 a month, it was $150 a month, you could start to raise the rent. And that the word would get out that, hey, the building across the street, their bill, you know, that guy's bill is $150 a month. I'm over here, I'm paying <coughs> $300 a month. When my lease comes up, I'm moving over there. So, <coughs> tough sell. I have been, it's been very difficult to convince uh, the, the kind of investors that I've been working with to make a bet like that. So, so having a, a, a situation, a, a program or a lending vehicle like PACE, uh, you don't have to have them make that bet because presumably PACE will pick up the cost of the energy efficiency and amortize it over time and the difference between the energy savings and that amortization payment is positive cash flow. But even with PACE, um, they're still going to be spending more initially, and that spending more is going to be both spending more in terms of time, understanding technology, installation, maintenance. I mean, there's a lot of costs attached to it. And what I'm wondering is if it's a developer, why? how do you really convince that developer that it's in his best interest, even with PACE? You know, he could just say, well, gee, I can just go build a thing like I've always been building, and I don't need to just deal with this pace and all this other stuff. How do you begin to make that attractive? Thank you. Well, the good news is, is that the capital markets are starting to recognize environmental obsolescence in buildings. And they're starting to place a value on buildings that are state of the art and that have minimal resource usage. Uh, because they realize that buildings that don't are essentially obsolete and that ultimately the market is going to start to award higher value to buildings that are not obsolete. So older building operators are almost going to be forced to start doing these kinds of upgrades and PACE gives them the vehicle to do it. New, new building, kind, I think it's easier in new construction because in new construction you can do an integrative design process where you're really designing in all the systems in an integrated way from the very beginning. And that includes controls, distributed controls. You should be able to control environments. On s the smaller the space you can control the environment, the more likely you're going to get, and, and in a programmable way, the more likely you're going to get lower energy usage. And then put building in energy measurement <coughs> so that you can measure energy uses that, and, and make sure that you're achieving the results you think you're going to achieve. And if you are, great. And if you're not, take another look at where is it not happening, what's not being delivered. So it, it's a little, I think it's a lot easier in new construction. It's one of the reasons we got out of renovation work uh, in, you know, 30 years ago. You, you never know the cost of a renovation until you're all finished. New construction, very predictable. And uh, I have to add to that, that particularly in Jersey City, the capital market institutions themselves are landlords. Uh, and uh, they understand the benefit uh, with respect to the bottom line, uh, with respect to their real estate holdings. Um, so that's another aspect of it. Uh, it's, it's, 
it's, it's sort of, uh, the more sophisticated the market becomes and the more that uh, everyone understand how everyone benefits out of this, uh, then the more financing that you'll see uh, become available. Thanks for taking the uh, question. Uh, my name is Michael Grace. I am the Democratic Assembly candidate for the 24th District up in northwestern New Jersey in Sussex County. We just experienced uh, uh, a major solar debacle with the Morris model. So Morris, Somerset, and Sussex uh, went into, a, uh, had a bit of a problem, which has now tainted the entire um, perception of public-private partnerships and this idea of public financing for these uh, types of projects. PACE is a completely different model. How do you envision getting past that heavy lift that we now seem to have to overcome in the districts, especially like Sussex, St. Morris, and uh, Somerset County, where PACE is different, but now tainted with the Morris model, where there's a possible you know, settlement bankruptcy lawsuits pending and so on and so forth. How, how do you see yourselves as businessmen? This, this question might be better for the next panel, but how do you guys see yourself as practical uh, business people and businessmen using uh, PACE now overcoming this, uh, this issue. What, what was the issue specifically? I, I, don't, I don't know about that deal. What was the specific issue? Well, the Morris model basically uh, used uh, LLCs, public-private LLCs, to set up um, the company with a, a company called Solar Sunlight General in New York City. And the construction company out of North Carolina, Mastac, was wound up holding the bag. They wound up having to sue Sunlight General which actually set up these public-private partnerships with Sussex, Morris, and Somerset. Uh, the construction company wound up being a general contractor, uh, lost their lien, lost their, uh, on both sides, their, their mechanics lien and their lien against the funds, wound up winning an arbitration, which because Sunlight General never put their 30% up. So now there's this tainted perception that these new environmental projects are uh, these public-private partnerships are really just a, kind of a scam in essence or kind of tainted in the sense that the public shouldn't be getting involved in these ideas, leave it to business alone. PACE is something completely different, I understand that, but how do you overcome that? Well, I, I think the key point, and, and I, like I said, I've worked on the public and public-private side for the last five years. Um, first of all, if you're gonna enter into a public-private partnership, you have to have the same diligence there on costs and you know, everything's gotta make sense. But, um, you know, PACE is, at the end of the day, all we really need the municipality to do is to put the assessment on the property and bill and collect. It's that simple. Um, PACE is voluntary by the building owner, okay? So we're doing projects with building owners that have a strategic vision and are compelled to do something to their building. And then lastly, as also kind of the chief investment officer and, and kind of heading our underwriting, I can tell you that we're writing to um, what's becoming kind of a national standard and we're writing to institutional investment grade standards for not only um, putting structured finance or other or bond funds um, into these projects, um, but also writing to investment grade standards in terms of engineering and in terms of of energy efficiency standards through ASHRAE, so that's 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 the way. And, and, I, and like I said, um, our communities want to get involved because um, they want to make this tool available to their their businesses. And we see kind of a bifurcated market here. Um, we see a lot of activity in the small to medium sized business where they really need <coughs> the capital formation to repurpose their buildings. Um, it's not like a building owner saves up over 20 or 30 years to do the next, you know, redo of their building. And then the other end of the market is in um, a more complex capital stack where you're doing a major redevelopment um, of a building and, and actually driving major downtown impacts in, in whatever city USA, call it Rust Belt Mid Midwest, where we've done, you know, like in Milwaukee, in Toledo, in St. Louis, where we're driving major impacts in these um, urban areas. I, I would also say, uh, the other thing you could take a look at is a 
you know, sorry to hear whatever happened there, but uh, you, you could say, well, that's maybe the way you don't want to do energy efficiency and, and look around the rest of the country, like especially in Connecticut, for example, which has a very active market. And, you know, there's, there's not, there have not been any problems like that, primarily because it's, it's the building owner themselves and, and there isn't any public-private, you know, relationship there. Uh, so I think, I think that's your best example, is just point to the rest of the country and other examples of success. I would, I would also point out we haven't had one default in five years and everybody's paying on time pretty much. Yeah, it's a really major thing. So thank you very much. We're going to move on to the next panel, the last panel. <laughs>